Give the Lord a praise offering for the gift that he's given to us. Gift of the Holy Spirit. And we experience one of the gifts of the Spirit. In fact, two of the gifts of the Spirit this morning. Gift of tongues and interpretation. That the church may be edified. And I, I want you to know God wants you never to forget that whatever you need, he will provide. Everything you're looking for, you'll find in the Lord. To those of you that are seeking the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you're born again, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you in something. We want to invest in you. We have a book. This book we have given literally thousands upon thousands of these books over the years, in the last 50 years. It's written by Lloyd Singley. It's a friend of our families lives in Louisiana. We won't hold that against him. But this book is, is really a very simple book, a simple, simple explanation about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And if you have not been baptized, if you're born again, and you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, this is a gift that God has promised to you. Peter, when he stood on the day of Pentecost, he said, this gift is for you and your children and many who are far off as many as the Lord God will call. And if you're born again, my brother, sister, God has called you. And this gift is for you. And we want to invest in your life. So if you are born again and have never experienced the fullness of the Spirit and are open to receive every gift that God has for you, we're going to invest one of these books into your hand. If you go to the Departmental Activity Center, the Welcome Center, immediately following the service, if you will tell them, Pastor said I could have one of these books. There's only two things I require that you do. Number one, if you take the book free of charge, read it. Doesn't do you any, you can't get it in your head by pounding your head with it. You got to read it. And it's simple read, quite frankly, very simple read. But if you read it, we'll invest in your life. Just go to the Welcome Center, tell them Pastor Steve said I could have one of the books and they'll be happy to give it. Now, if you're a Brazewood worshiper and you're seeking the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you can tell them. If you can afford it, tell them I'll buy a book. They're only $2.00. And, but we'll invest for those that are seeking the infilling of the Spirit free. Everybody say free. free. Uh, say it again, free. free. <laughs> we'll invest it in your life free if you promise to read it and simply seek God's best in your life, His gift in your life. To those of you that are with us for the first, second, or third time, we are honor you and are honored to have you in our service this morning. If you would, please, uh, scan that QR code that you see on the screen there. It'll take you to a place where you can very simply give us basic information about you so that we can know that you're here. I can't imagine anything that would be more disturbing to me to be in a place and nobody know that I was there. Nobody knows I exist. Well, we're glad you're here. Honored. And if you will, fill that card out with as much information as you're willing to give us and then we will in no way pressure you. But we also have a gift for you. As soon as this service is over, if you will take the last page of that QR code, go about five steps out this front door, turn to your left, our hospitality suite. Dr. Darlington will be there to meet you. We have a gift to give you, and you'll have some of the best coffee you've ever had in your life. And if it's not good coffee, I'm sorry. <laughs> we come back next Sunday. We'll make it better. Just let us know you didn't enjoy the coffee. We'll make it better, I guarantee you. But we're so glad that you're here this morning. And at the conclusion of the service, please make your way back and let us greet you officially. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And how many of you know the Spirit of the Lord is here? Amen. I have sensed God's presence here from the moment I arrived today. And I've not been disappointed. And I want you to know, God knew that you'd be here today. And God has something very, very special for you. I pray that you'll open your heart and receive what God has and he will provide it for you. And by the way, what God has for you is custom made just for you. It'll fit you to the T because God knows you and God has you in mind. Praise the Lord. How many of you know God has a plan? In every detail of life, everywhere you go, every circumstance you face, God has a plan. Pastor Shane was with us last week and did a wonderful job. He is such a sweet man of God. And as we were traveling, going out to lunch, I was testifying to you. I told him, I said, Pastor Shane, I am God's favorite. And he said, no, I'm God's favorite. And I said, no, I'm God's favorite. We went back and forth for a little while. And then we decided we're both God's favorite. And I said to him, God does great things in my life. And he does big things in my life, but he also does small things. 
God is concerned with the significant parts of our life, but he's also concerned with the smallest details of our life. And I told him what I've told you, that oftentimes when Don and I are going someplace, God will provide the very best parking lot in the entire parking place just for me. Just for me. And, and you know, that's a small thing. It's not important. It's not a, it's not a life-changing thing or life-altering thing. But it's just God saying to me, you are important to me. And right after I'd gotten those words out of my mouth, there was right by the front door a space open for me. And I turned to Pastor Saint. I said, see, I told you so. <laughs> now, that's not a big thing. I can walk. I can go to the back of the parking lot and walk as, as, as well as I could walk five feet to a door. But God cares about the small details of your life. But he also cares about the big things of your life as well. The things that you're not capable of. If God called you to it, God will help you do it. I said, if God called you to it, God will help you do it. Amen. God never abandons his children, ever. He's always with us. But God has a plan. And can I tell you this morning, you are a part of God's plan. From the day you were born. In fact, the Bible says, the day you were conceived, God had a plan for your life. And I'm going to tell you what part of that plan is. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the scripture tells us a part of that plan. The Bible says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Say everyone. everyone. You see, God is no respecter of persons. That's what Pastor Shane reminded me of, that if I'm God's favorite, you're God's favorite as well. But I am. The calling that God has put upon your life and my life is to be a proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word gospel literally means good news. You and I are about good news. We're not about bad news. There's enough bad news in this world that it doesn't need any more bad news. There's bad news in this world. What the world needs is good news. And the good news is God cares about every detail of your life. God cares about you and he loves you. But the scripture says, I am not ashamed. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's not that I'm just not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news. If you're here today and you're born again, you've experienced the good news. I want you to know this morning, my God is a happy God. Did you hear me? My God is a happy God. He smiles more than he frowns and he laughs more than he cries. How do you know, Pastor? Because the Bible says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And if his joy is my strength, he's got to be a happy God. Well, if God is a happy God, and the Spirit of Christ dwells within you, my brother and sister, you need to be happy too. You need to be filled with the joy of the Lord every day. So my word at the end of every service is, choose joy. Choose joy when you're driving on the freeways of Houston. Well, that's when you need the joy of the Lord. Choose joy when there's no parking spot in the very front. Choose joy when somebody's cut you off. Choose go joy when somebody's blessed you, and I don't mean blessed you. Choose joy. Why? Because God's joy is what dwells in our heart. Not just in the good days, but in every day, God's joy fills our heart and life. And I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to be the light of Christ. I'm not ashamed to be an ambassador of his joy. I'm not ashamed to proclaim Jesus is the way. There is no other way. The Bible says there's one way to the Father, and his name is Jesus. Can I tell you something? I said this a couple of weeks ago, and it, it was something that God birthed into my spirit. I want to share with, with you again. When God breathed life into dust, can I tell you, you're not an accident. You are not an accident. You're not an accident of nature. You're not an accident of your parent. You have been designed by God. When God breathed into dust, the only, the only being, the only created breathe, being that God breathed into was humanity. And when God breathed the breath of life, the breath of life, not existence, not the breath of survival, not the breath of just getting by, but when God breathed the breath of life into humanity, he created a place that only God could fill. A void that only the Spirit of the Lord could fill. A void where only the breath of God could fill. And people have been looking to fill that void every day since then. Do you know that there are societies 
Almost every society, every people group has a God from the beginning of time. You see it in Bible. You see it in the Old Testament where heathen nations had gods that they served. The nation of Egypt had one God. It was the golden, eye, golden calf. Eventually, the children of Israel bowed to the golden calf. What was the golden calf? Egypt's desire to fill that void that God placed within their heart. And I declare to you this morning, nothing fills that void but the Spirit of God. Nothing will fill that void but the breath of God. And people are going to extreme measures to find truth. Going to extreme measures to find something that will fill that void within their heart. They're doing weird things today. Bizarre things today in an effort to fill that void. You and I, we've experienced the filling of that void. And by the way, when God fills that void, you don't have to search any longer. You have the truth. You don't have to search for anything outside, anything exterior. You have the truth, and it satisfies. Can I tell you this morning, Jesus satisfies. No longer having to search for external stimulus to fill the void. God's desire. And the good news is this. If you're searching and you haven't found what will satisfy eternally, today you can accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Today is a day of salvation, the Bible says. And if you come to that place, if you're at that place where you recognize, I've tried everything else, I've tried so many things, and isn't it interesting that everybody will tell you what you need to have. If you only have this, it'll satisfy you. If you only go here, you'll be satisfied. If you only do this, you'll be satisfied. And people have followed that and followed that advice and gone to those things only to discover nothing satisfies, which only means you have to go to something else and something else and something else in an effort to find that breath of God within your heart and life. And I want to tell you something, God will breathe upon you today. God is breathing upon us today anew and afresh. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's the gospel. It's not what I've made up. It's not religion. I heard somebody say recently that Jesus never came to establish a church. I totally disagree with you. The Bible says, in fact, in the scripture we're going to read in a moment, he said, I will build my... He said, I'll build my what? He said, I'll build my church. He wasn't talking about a denomination. He was talking about a group of people that would gather together in his name. He will build his church. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the gospel leads people to Jesus. Unadulterated. Uncompromised. Gospel will lead people to Jesus. And Jesus will bring salvation to everyone who comes to him. He will cast no one aside. To those that do the worst, fall the farthest, committed the biggest sins against humanity, you come to Jesus, he'll forgive you. He'll accept you as his child. The gospel leads to Jesus. Jesus brings salvation to all believe, and salvation brings transformation, brings change, change our life. My, my brother and sister, the Bible says, be not conformed to this world. Why? Because it'll never fill the void in your heart. Be not conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed. Salvation. Gospel brings to Jesus, and bring, Jesus brings salvation, and salvation brings transformation, change. Complete change in our life. So that what was once was and defined our life is no longer a part of our life. We're free. We're liberated. But you and I, and especially in this season of time, we cannot change the gospel. We cannot add to it. We cannot take away from it. We cannot make it different than it is. And you know, humanity has tried to do that from the beginning of time. And every time we mess with the gospel, we mess things up. It's what religion does. Religion messes things up. Where God says, do this, all of a sudden, humanity has added 15 things to the do this. Find this. We add 15 things to it to find. When God says one way to the Father, and that's through the Son. You and I have no right to change the gospel. Because it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation. And the minute we desire to change it, we've messed things up. 
We're no longer leading people to Jesus. We're leading people to religion. Or we're leading people to our way. We have no right to subtract from it or add to it. And I declare to you this morning, the church of Jesus Christ is awake. And if we're not awake, we're getting awake. We're getting awake to the necessity of knowing that God is the answer to every need of humanity. Jesus is the answer to every pain and suffering that humanity has. God has a plan. Jesus had an encounter with the disciples when he asked them a very simple question. Who do people say that I am? That's an interesting question. Why would it concern Jesus with what other people say? Who do people say that I am? And they had an answer. Because the disciples were listening. I pray today we are listening to humanity. I pray we're not turning a deaf ear or turning a religious ear to the cries of humanity. For my brother and sister, what may seem like rebellion often is a cry for help. And they had an answer for Jesus. He, they say you're a prophet. They say you're a, a teacher. In fact, they basically say you're everything but the Messiah. They didn't say it that way, but that's what they were saying. But then Jesus turned it around and he asked them a personal question. And I believe that God is answering us, asking us this question as well. You know what other people say. You know the concept and the perception of other people. But the real question is, Jesus said to the disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? In Matthew chapter 16, in verse 15, Jesus pressed them, the message version says, and how about you? Who do you say that I am? Can I tell you what Jesus was implying or saying? To be my follower, you must have a personal encounter with me. To be my follower, to be my disciple, you've got to know who I am. And the only way to know who Jesus is, is not intellectually only. There are people that can tell you everything about Jesus. I have talked with people in prison and they can tell you all about Jesus. I've talked to some homeless people and they can tell you all about Jesus. I've talked to some sinners and they can tell you all about Jesus. But it's not how much you know, it's that you know him personally. An encounter. And can I tell you, when you have an encounter with God, it's going to be a change for the rest of your life. Never go back to the way things were. You are transformed or in the process of being transformed. Jesus said to the disciples, you know what other people say that I am, but do you have an encounter with me? And Simon Peter in verse 16 said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That was a revelation. In fact, Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. You didn't learn it in a class. You didn't learn it on the radio. You didn't learn it on TV. You learned it because you had an encounter with me, the Messiah. And that's what comes next. Not only to have an encounter with Jesus, but to have a revelation of Jesus. A revelation of really, truly who he is. A revelation of what he can be and what he can do in your life. A revelation that he can break every chain of bondage in your life. A revelation that he is your healer. He is your deliverer. He is your baptizer. New, a new and fresh revelation of Jesus. On Wednesday night, we're going to be talking about rediscovering your passion. Rediscovering, as they said in the book of Revelation, your first love. It doesn't have to be a dead relationship. It can be a living. Do you have an encounter with Jesus? Do you have a revelation? Then verse 17 and 18, Jesus came back. God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You did not get that answer out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself, let you in on a secret of who I really am. A revelation. God, speak revelation into our hearts. God, speak revelation into our heart. That we don't have to live on old manna, we can live on new manna. We don't have to live on old wine, we can have new wine in the Spirit. God, give us a true, vivid relationship or re revelation of who you are. And then Jesus goes on. Now I'm going to tell you, who you really are. You are Peter. You are a rock. I want you to know this morning, God is calling you a rock as well. Amen. Stable. Unmovable. You're Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put my church together, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. That's the church. So 
We find an encounter with Jesus is necessary for each and every one. Secondly, a revelation of Christ. A growing revelation of who he is and what he desires to do through us. And then thirdly, he builds a relevant church. A relevant church. Not a church that is tossed like the wave. Not a church that is going with the wind of every doctrine that comes along. But a church that is grounded upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of Christ. It's a relevant church. A relevant church is a church that stands on the authority of God's word. Because God's word is truth. God's word is truth. That's what people are looking for. That's what people today are looking for. And I'm not a prophet, but I can read the times. I can read the signs. At some point, these that are searching for the truth, that may be wandering into weird and wonderful things, are eventually going to come to realize it's all emptiness. It's all emptiness. The thing that I thought would define me is emptiness. The thing that I thought would bring sense to life is all emptiness. The thing that everyone told me would change my life is all emptiness. And my brother and sister, when they come to that revelation in their spirit, when they come to identify that hole within their heart that only God, only the breath of God can fill, in that moment they're going to be looking for truth. Real truth. And the word of God is truth. And if the church does not stand on and for the word of God, the church fails. And the church becomes irrelevant. You see, the church is not about existing. The church is not about having services. The the church is not about singing songs and listening to the greatest preacher on the face of the earth. That's not what the church is about. The church is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church is about truth, its relevance. And I got to tell you, we don't have to be like the world to be relevant. In fact, in fact, if we're like Jesus, we will be relevant. If we embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, we will be relevant. Because all of the things they're looking for today have no relevance whatsoever. No way fills that void of the breath of God breathing into the spirit of humanity. We do not exist. We do not live to exist or survive, but we live to thrive. We live to be the light, the light of Jesus Christ all over the world. I want to close with these words. We must exhibit the spirit of Christ in this world. I'm not saying we're not. I'm just saying we have to be the light of Jesus Christ. Peter had a problem. Well, let me rephrase that. Peter had a lot of problems. But one problem he had was a racial problem. One problem that Peter had was a cultural problem. And God is going to deal with our problems. God doesn't wink and blink or turn his head on our problems. He confronts our problems. And the reason that he confronts confronts our problems and our biases is because they harm us and they harm humanity. So Peter had a dream, a vision. And the vision was very pronounced, very definitive. If you remember the story, it's in Acts chapter 10. God gave Peter a vision, a vision of animals that came down, and God said to Peter, eat, eat to your fill. But they were animals that were not according to the law, not according to culture. And Peter said, I can't. I can't do it. Let me tell you something. Anytime God tells you to do something, don't say, I can't. I can't do it. And God spoke to Peter in this vision. Don't call unclean what I have declared is clean. Don't call unclean what I have declared is is clean. And right on the edge of that dream, there was a knock at the door. And God had given a, a vision to Cornelius, a Gentile. A vision that there was something more that he had. His heart was open to the things of God, but there was something more that he needed in his life. Nothing was filling that void in Cornelius's heart. And God told him about Peter. 
And I want you to know, if God told Cornelius about Peter and Peter had a problem, God had to deal with Peter's heart first. And so Cornelius sent his messengers. They knocked on the door. Peter opened the door and they said, come with us. And in the natural, Peter would have said, oh, no, I will not. And maybe even slammed the door in their face. Because that would have been his response. And you knowing Peter's nature, you could almost see him doing something like that. But God opened his heart. God brought a revelation to Peter. An encounter with Jesus and a revelation. Not only that Jesus was the Son of God, but that God opened the kingdom for more than just a small little group. God opened the kingdom for more than just the assemblies of God. God opened the kingdom for more than just Brazewood. Peter went with Cornelius, totally contrary to his life, totally contrary to his nature, but he'd had an encounter with God, a revelation. And Cornelius, when Peter came, Cornelius spoke to Peter and said this, Therefore, I immediately sent for you, talking to Peter, and you did the right thing in coming. So we are all present before God to hear everything you've commanded by the Lord. Then Peter began to speak. Now I really understand that God shows no favoritism. God shows no favoritism. And can I tell you, I'm so glad that he doesn't. Because if he did, I would probably be left outside. But in every nation, the person who fears him, in every nation, the person who fears him and does righteous is accepted by him. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on those who heard the message. You know, sometimes we think we've got to have the right words. The Bible says, don't worry what you're going to say. Be prepared. But don't worry what you're going to say. All Peter did was tell him about Jesus. That's all he did. Probably, perhaps, a very simple message. But in the midst of the message, the Spirit fell upon that group of people. Can I tell you, if you'll speak the truth, if you'll speak the gospel, God will do the rest. Did you hear me this morning? If you speak the gospel, if you live the gospel, you proclaim the gospel, God will do the rest. Because it's His word, not your word. It's His word, not my word. I don't have to back up God's word. God will back up his word. I don't have to prove God's word. God will prove his word. The circumcised believers who came with Peter were astounded. Why? Because Peter had the revelation they didn't. Peter got the word. They just followed Peter. And the Bible says they were astounded because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also been poured out on the heathen, had been poured out on those that were typically left behind or left on the outside. And all of a sudden, God shows Peter and the other Jews that were circumcised, he showed them, I will respect no one. But my gift is for everyone. And and the Bible says, let me read, for they heard them speaking in other languages and discerning the greatness of God. Here's the situation. Well, let me go on. Then Peter responded, Can anyone withhold water baptism and prevent these people from being baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just like we did? On the day of Pentecost, the Bible says they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. The initial, the initial, uh, first initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the prayer language that God gives to one. you find it very clearly in this book. And then, after the day of Pentecost... At Cornelius' house, the very same thing happened to the amazement of the religious crowd. Then Peter said, you see, God is no respecter of persons. My question to you this morning is, what would have been Peter's response had he not had the revelation? When the knocking of the door came, and Cornelius' messengers were there at the door, and they said, come with us, If Peter had not had that revelation, what do you think he would have done? Think he would have slammed the door? You think he would have rejected those men? You think he would have shown disdain for their request that they would ask him, a Jew, to come and visit them? Or would he respond in horror, cannot believe they would do such a thing? 
Another question would be, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus have done? And you know, we don't have to ponder that question. We don't have to come up with the answer ourselves. All you have to do is go to the book. Go to the Bible and find out what Jesus did with the outcasts of his day. What he did with the people that were hated. I'm reminded of Zacchaeus and the woman caught in adultery. I'm reminded of the Samaritan woman. I'm reminded of the, of the lepers. All who came to Jesus, he didn't cast them out. He didn't spew hatred towards them. What did he do? He showed them love and acceptance. But he didn't leave them the way he found them. To Zacchaeus, what a radical change in Zacchaeus' life that he would be willing to give multiple times what he has stolen and give much to the poor. That's a radical transformation, my friend, especially for a tax collector. The woman at the well, what did Jesus do? He told her all of the things that were in her life and brought her living water. What did she do? She went back to the village. And she told the village all the things she had seen and heard. And the Bible says the entire village went out to meet him. Why? Because there was a hole in their heart. And when they encountered Jesus, what happened? The Bible says they said to the woman, we don't believe now because of what you've said. We believe now because we've experienced it for ourselves. A whole city was changed. The woman caught in adultery. Jesus had an encounter with her. A woman that had been used and abused by men perhaps much of her life. And again being used by men. Religious crowd. The Bible says she was caught in the very act of adultery. They brought her to Jesus. You can only imagine what she looked like. You can only imagine the smell. You can only imagine the shame upon this woman as they were brought her to Jesus and cast her at his feet. Told him all of the things that they had done. By the way, you remember... The story, they brought her to Jesus, but they didn't bring the men who had been acted with her. Jesus, if you know the story, besides writing in the dirt, nobody knows what he wrote. But he looked at the guys and he said, I got a I gotta deal with you, buddies. The law says to cast a stone, so I'm going to tell you, if you've never sinned in your life, you throw the first stone. And you know what they did. They didn't throw any stones. They walked away ashamed. And then Jesus looked up at her and said, where are your accusers? There are none. He said, neither do I go. He didn't change the word. He didn't make it easy. He didn't make it hard. The word is the word. Truth is truth. He accepted her the way that she was, but he didn't leave her the way she, he found her. Amen. Go and sin no more. I'm thinking of the lepers. The lepers came to Jesus. What did he do? The Bible says he touched them, which under the law would have implied right then and there that he was unclean. There was a problem, however. The lepers who came to him in leprosy left clean. You can take all of these examples and many more in the scripture and you can relate it to today. To the people who are outcasts. The people that are despised. The people that nobody cares about. The people that have been given up on by society or families or friends. The people that have been searching for truth. Desperately searching for th truth. Thinking this will help me. This will bring an end to my search only to find they're as empty as they were before. Jesus accepted them. What would Jesus have done? But I think a real question is, what would we do? We're encountering these things every day. We see it on the news. We see it in our stores. We see people who have fallen for such fairy tales. What do we do? You see, God changed Peter's vision with revelation. He saw things differently after that dream, and it changed him. He saw people. He saw that God shows no favorites. 
that God's love and God's grace is applied equally to everyone. In the Revelation, that's what Peter saw. My question to you today is, what do you see? What do you see? Sin can be repulsive. The sin of humanity can be confounding. But what do you see? We need a revelation like Peter had. Perhaps not a dream, but a revelation nonetheless. That when we see all of the mess of humanity around us, we don't see the mess, we see the pain. When we look at humanity and they're running towards extremes, we don't look at them with disdain or hatred, but we see them through the eyes of Jesus. And can I tell you something? We need a revelation. We need a revelation. We need to see the way that Jesus sees. And can I tell you, sometimes that's a challenge. Sometimes that's a challenge. Sometimes it's beyond our ability. But when we truly get a revelation that God loved me the way I was, God loved me in the depths of my sin, He loved me in the emptiness of my life. He loved me in spite of my hatred. He loved me in spite of the searching. He loved me. And I pray, and I'm trying. I'm asking God to open my eyes in a different way so that when I see people, people, not what they wear, not what they're doing, not that what they're professing, but when I see people, I'll see them with the eyes of Jesus. And I'll close with this. Jesus' harsh words were never applied towards those who were in sin. The harshest that he spoke to were to two groups of people. One, to the disciples. When they tried to keep the children from Jesus, the Bible says he was indignant, he was mad. But the second group, They got more of his ire than the disciples did, and that was the religious crowd. The religious crowd that didn't see the people. The religious crowd that didn't see the tax collector, didn't see the woman caught in adultery, didn't see the Samaritan, didn't see the leper. They just saw their sin. But Jesus saw the person, and he loved them. And can I tell you this? Sometimes you've got to show the love of Jesus before you can share the love of Jesus. Sometimes we want to tell people everything they need to hear. We haven't earned the right to speak into their life. We haven't demonstrated, shown, they haven't experienced the love of Jesus from us. So they're just words. But when we convey the love of Christ, when we're the light, when we're the light in this dark, 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 dark world people will be drawn to the light God give us a vision like Peter give us a vision like Peter and we will awaken and we will be the bearers of good news Heavenly Father thank you for your word thank you for Peter Thank you that Peter would be obnoxious sometimes. Peter would be hard-headed sometimes. But when he heard a word, Peter's heart would be changed. I can be obnoxious sometimes. I can be hard-headed sometimes. I can be blind sometimes. Lord, give me a revelation. Give me a revelation. Help my heart to be broken with the things that break your heart. And help me to rejoice in the things that you joy over. Father, we are not going to bend to the whims and the will of this world. We will, I declare, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God and salvation to everyone who will believe. Father, give us revelation. Open our eyes and help us to respond in the way that Jesus would respond every single time. This we ask. Father, I pray in the course of this week that we will receive visions from the Lord. 
I pray this week, Lord, we'll have dreams. I pray this week that as we read Scripture, as we pray, that our heart will be opened as never before and that this will be a transforming hour of this church. And I give you thanks for it in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And the key is, if you're here this morning and you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you say, Pastor Steve, why would you say that? We're the church. I pray, here's my prayer, friends. I pray that every service we have, people who are searching for the truth will be in this sanctuary. And that's what we'll share, truth. Not dogma, not religion, not tradition, but what we will share is truth. And if you're here this morning and in the darkest of night, when you're all alone by yourself, nobody around, not trying to impress anybody, but you're alone with your own thoughts. What's the story of your life? What does the story of your life look like? You don't have to impress anybody, it's just you. And if there is that hole in your heart, if you're searching for the truth, regardless of where it's taken you, and you realize that you're not there, you haven't found it, it's not something that is fleeing from you, the truth is Jesus. And I'll tell you this, if your story, the story of your life, is not what you thought it'd be, not what you wanted it to be, not what you want it to be, Jesus will change the story of your life, give you a life worth living, you give you substance, He'll fill that place in your life, in your heart, that nothing else will fill. You've tried everything else, everything that the world has to offer, and nothing works. Jesus will change your life. And he'll give you a life truly worth living. Psalms chapter 34, verse 17 says, Is anyone crying for help? God is listening, and he's ready to rescue you. That's the truth. And I want to say, if you're here this morning and you need or want or desire that change in your heart and life, after this service is over, Brother Sonny Arrow is going to be meeting you right here, not to keep you, not to have you join the church, but rather just to encourage you in the Lord and to get you, give you something, a gift that will be a reminder, the first in a memorial that you'll be, begin to build of all of the wonderful things that God will do in your life. If you will just take a moment of time, just for a short prayer, word of encouragement, nobody happy like Sonny Arrow is happy. He'll be happy to share that truth with you, and we will walk with you in faith. Can I hear an amen?